I'm here now in the middle of Kent, in down, not far from Down Village. And behind me here is the famed sand walk of Charles Darwin. In 1846, Charles Darwin leased this land from Sir John Lubbock. And uh, this is a 1.5 acre strip of land, which he had planted with birch trees and had a path running around it. At the moment now, we are standing on the side uh, that's often called the light side, while the other side is embedded in the birch trees there, the part of the path that's called the dark side. This is often called uh, Darwin's thinking path, and this is where he spent much of his time thinking about evolution. Uh, colleagues and friends would have walked with him on this sand walk uh, and discussed aspects of his work. Uh, this area is a very flint heavy landscape. This path itself is not so much sand as pebbled flint all the way down. Charles would take a number of nodules of flint and would line them up. Every time he'd done a lap and he would kick one of them to a side. And there's funny stories about the children who would push the kicked nodule back in its place to confuse Charles when he'd be doing doing the rounds. It's a lovely day here in the middle of April in 2016 and I just wanted to take the time to talk about this particular book which has come out, it's been out for a few months now, um, it came out in December and it's a collection of all of the papers that are associated with the fossil of Kidanamu. Now, Kidanamu, for those of you who don't know, is a three million year old or over three million year old fossil of a species called Australopithecus afarensis. Now, this fossil was found in Waronsomile in Eastern Africa, in Ethiopia, dated to around three million years ago, a little bit older than that. And uh, it's only uh, in the last few months that the actual papers have been published. The fossil was first announced in 2010, and it's only now that the collection of papers have been published. And there's some really, really gorgeous CT scans of the fossils themselves. Uh, so here we have the clavicle bone, and then of course we have some of the long bones there. Uh, we've got the pelvic girdle here, uh, your shoulder blade basically. This uh, work was uh, headed by Johannes Haile Selassie of the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. I have been waiting a long time for a skeleton like this to be found. Many people have, some even longer than me. The KSDVP-1 forward slash 1 skeleton, nicknamed Kadanamu, is the first partial skeleton ever discovered of a large Australopithecus afarensis individual. It is the oldest partial skeleton of any Australopithecus individual and contains skeletal elements not previously known for Australopithecus afarensis. As such, it has new stories to tell about the biology and the evolution of Australopithecus. Until now, the only reasonably complete Australopithecus afarensis skeleton known was the famous Lucy skeleton, AL2881. Lucy was discovered 40 years ago, that is in 1974. And until the discovery of Kadanamu in 2005, she remains the earliest securely dated Australopithecus partial skeleton. Not only is Lucy a cultural icon within paleoanthropology and among the public worldwide, she is also a significant. She's also significant because much of what we know about Australopithecus afarensis comes from studies of her skeleton. Lucy along with isolated skeletal elements from the large sample of Australopithecus afarensis recovered at the site AL333 and other finds from the sites of Hadar, Maka and Digika over the years has revealed that the body size near human-like pelvis and bipedal locomotor adaptation seen in the more recent and less securely dated South African Australopiths had appeared prior to three million years ago. These fossils have provided overwhelming and convincing evidence that the postcranial skeleton of Australopithecus afarensis was adapted for habitual, committed, terrestrial, bipedal locomotion, long before human evolution witnessed an increase in brain size or reduction in the face. And dentition characterizing the genus Homo. Despite 
being the most well represented, well dated and well understood species of early hominin known so far, a vigorous and occasionally rancorous debate has surrounded the ways in which Australopithecus afarensis differs from Homo. While there is no doubt that Australopithecus afarensis individuals were committed terrestrial bipeds, they were not exactly like Homo in their postcranial anatomy. These differences have begged the question of why these differences exist, whether from active selection to retain some measure of arboreal competence, or whether these differences were adaptively neutral and only displayed later in the face of different selection, either associated with improved terrestrial locomotor efficiency and or positive selection for manipulatory or other behaviours in the origin of Homo. This debate is ongoing and while Kadanamu does not solve this debate, it does add key pieces of data that continue to shape it. Kadanamu tells us many things that Lucy and the other fossils have not. A few in particular that stand out to me as particularly salient. Namely, Cadanamu has the first complete tibia length known for any Australopithecus individual, supporting the hypothesis that Australopithecus afarensis did not have the relatively short lower limbs like an ape, but rather long legs like humans. Cadanamu has ribs complete enough to reveal a broad upper thorax, re reflecting vertebral invagination and fully upright posture in Australopithecus afarensis, rather than the cone-shaped great ape-like rib cage previously inferred from less complete fossil material. Cadanamu also gives us the first fully described cervical vertebrae for any Australopithecus. The small upper and larger lower vertebrae with small spinous processes and facet joints proportioned like those of humans appear to reflect human-like head carriage of a relatively small cranium with large prognathic face but with a larger neck musculature and large likely lack of a nuchal ligament. Cadanamu's remarkably complete scapula and clavicle, the first known for an adult of this species not only supports the interpretation that the shoulder joint of Australopithecus afarensis was indeed oriented more cranially than that of humans, but also shown that the infraspinous fossa was large and the musculature of the clavicle and scapula were human-like, perhaps suggesting a shift from arboreal competence towards use of the upper limb in manipulatory function. Significantly unlike Lucy, who was much smaller than modern humans, Kadanamu is as large as a small human. As a consequence of Lucy's small size, there has been inherent lingering uncertainty as to whether her morphology differed from that of humans because she had different adaptations, or whether she was just small. Cadanamu nicely answers this question, confirming that Australopithecus afarensis did indeed differ from those of humans regardless of size. This volume presents this information and much more in a series of chapters describing the, and analysing the various bones of Kidanamu's skeleton, along with its geological and paleoecological context. The descriptive chapters provide thorough and detailed images, descriptions and functional analysis. The authors then all take a further step and provide their interpretations of the implications of their findings, which are integrated and summarised in the last chapter, to provide a cohesive interpretation of the biology of Australopithecus afarensis. From this interpretation, as in the individual analytic chapters, the authors put Australopithecus afarensis into the context of known hominin fossils and hypothesise about what this all means for the origin of hominins and the subsequent appearance of the genus Homo. The scenario presented here builds an analysis published recently by contributors in this volume and is consistent with much of the new fossil evidence that has been recovered over the past few years. It presents an exciting new perspective in hominin origins and many testable predictions can be, and as I am sure will be, drawn from it 
by these and other scholars for years to come. So while Kadanamu answers key questions about Australopithecus afarensis, like all good fossils, it raises at least as many questions as it answers. This skeleton and this careful and thorough volume provides a solid stepping stone for future research on the early part of human evolution. This volume is sure to become a staple in every paleoanthropologist library and an important reference work for generations to come.